Hi, everyone. This is Brian Armstrong, and welcome to Coinbase's Around the Block podcast. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about the U.S. midterm elections and what the results could mean for crypto. Joining me for that discussion are Coinbase's U.S. Head of Policy, Kara Calvert, Marta Belcher, General Counsel of the Labs, and Chris Lahane, the Chief Strategy Officer for Han Ventures. Before diving in on the midterm elections, I'm first going to chat with my Chief of Staff, Mark Trelawney, about what's top of mind at Coinbase. Well, Brian, it's been a, a couple of turbulent weeks here in crypto um, with a number of crypto companies in the headlines, not just the crypto headlines, but even into the mainstream press. Um, but you're still confident in Coinbase and the future of crypto. What makes Coinbase different in your view? Yeah, well, crypto is not going anywhere. Uh, just one bad actor does not put the whole thing at jeopardy. Just like if you have Bernie Madoff or someone like that, you know, it doesn't like destroy the entire financial system. So hopefully nobody is thinking that in these moments. But, um, you know, I do think it's important for people to realize how Coinbase specifically is different from, from FTX. And for people who aren't deep in the weeds on this, they may have just a very high level understanding of it. So look, the differences could not be more stark, right? Coinbase is based right here in the United States. FTX was in the Bahamas. They went to a jurisdiction that had very light oversight. Um, Coinbase does not own a market maker or a, an, you know, a hedge fund or some kind of uh, firm that tries to take uh, principal risk. FTX did. They had this other firm, Alameda. And you know, Coinbase does not commingle customer funds with corporate funds. Um, we have audited financial statements as a public company that looks at these things. You don't have to take our word for it. Um, it appears FTX was commingling that with their investment arm, right? And, you know, just going further than that, you know, Coinbase never invests customer funds without the customer's explicit direction. So we're basically holding the assets one for one, which means if you have one Bitcoin with us, we've got one Bitcoin. If you have $100, we've got $100. So there's no such thing as a run on the bank, uh, quote unquote, with Coinbase. If people want to withdraw their funds, 100% of it is there. You know, they can withdraw 100% of it. So... I think it's really important for people to realize these differences. But there's other things too. I mean, we never issued an exchange token, for instance. Um, FTT or you know, FTT was a, FTX's exchange token. So there's lots of lots of differences, and my hope is that people come out of this realizing how different these two companies are. What do you view as the biggest blockers to your average mainstream customer moving over to a self custody world? Like today, it's a little bit scary, but what do you think we need to solve to make that easier and more welcoming to more users? Yeah. I think in a word, it's usability. So the user experience is still a little tricky on some of these self-custodial wallets. And there is still risk of customer loss of funds, right? And you know, it wouldn't be from some third party who is uh, doing something nefarious like with FTX or accidental loss in some other case. But um, with a self-custodial wallet, there are instances, of course, of people losing their 12 word phrase, losing their phone. So we've put a lot of hard work into ensuring that, for instance, Coinbase wallet um, it's very difficult for customers to lose their funds. We basically force you know customers to make some kind of a backup. It's done in an encrypted way with one you know Google Cloud or, or um, Apple's cloud product. Um, I think there's really interesting things we can do over time around social recovery, uh, smart contract based wallets, or even if you want to do it entirely on your own, we should make it possible to do multi-party computation, multi-sig type applications in Coinbase Wallet. And I think. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting there, stuff there on the roadmap. And if, if we can get there, we'll see people storing, you know, huge amounts of money in self-custodial wallets, not just treating it as a wallet in Web3. Maybe switching gears, um, it feels pretty clear that we are in bear market territory in crypto. Uh, and as you think about entering this period, like how do you think Coinbase or even other um, crypto companies need to change course to harden, harden themselves for what could be a tough period? Yeah. Well, we've gone through lots of tough periods in crypto. Uh, Coinbase has been through four of these cycles now or so. And so it's good. Actually, it builds resilience. And the, the key thing to remember in these markets for every crypto company is basically don't die, right? Um, if you don't die, you'll come out of this thing even stronger. And you know, Coinbase is not going to die. We've got over $5 billion of cash on the balance sheet. Um, we're a very strong company. We've been through four cycles like this. We've come out of every single one stronger. But think about you know, go back to 2008, the financial crisis, right? There's lots of things which are unpleasant for companies to go through, like, you know, various big companies, Gold, Goldman Sachs and Wells Fargo, they had all kinds of, they had, you know, congressional testimony. Um, they had a lot of negative sentiment out there in the market. They had bad quarters where the public markets really hated them. Um, they 
I think they went through layoffs, like all kinds of things, right? And so that that was very uncomfortable for them, but that's very different than dying. Lehman Brothers actually died. And you know, nobody really looking back feels too strongly about those those difficult periods that the other firms went through, and it's because they survived and they and they lived to fight another day. So I think that's important for every crypto company, and it comes down to managing costs really carefully. It means operating more like a startup. It means you know having everybody on the team ship something that moves the ball forward every week, right? Minimize all the fake work and distractions that happens in big companies with too many layers of management and too many meetings and too many slide decks internally. Like actually build things which move the ball forward for our customers, make their lives better. Um, you know, try to, you know, don't have people that are just in purely managerial roles, managing a couple of people or something like you, you can flatten the org, make it more efficient. Um, Coinbase recently went through this uh, org change where we basically divided into what we call product groups, which are kind of intended to operate more like little startups um, ac across the different customer segments that we serve across consumers, institutional and developers. So these are all things that companies can do in a bear market to keep building, get back to being more like a startup manage costs carefully and make sure you don't die. Makes sense. And then maybe going back a little bit to the, the topic of trust, I think one of the uh, conversations that's been happening a lot on Twitter in the last couple of weeks is an interest in the CFI players in crypto uh, publishing proof of reserves. Uh, I'm curious what you think of that as a solution to situations like the FTX situation, if you think it would have solved that situation uh, and also how um, you're planning to uh, approach this with Coinbase. Yeah, so I think proof of reserves are a good step in the right direction, but they're not fully uh, perfect today. I'll talk about some of the limitations. And I think broadly, I've been using this term um, on-chain accounting, which I think is a really cool area of development that'll be really, really important over time. So there's different ways people have done proof of reserves. Um, some of them are just showing assets, which would be you know, cold storage addresses, hot wallet addresses, things like that. Um, and then, of course, you know, you'd have to actually sign messages to get proof of assets. But with just the assets, uh, you're not showing the liabilities, right? And so other firms have actually integrated these, these Merkle tree solutions to kind of s sign messages to show that, hey, my balance is actually part of this bigger tree of, of signatures that ultimately shows this total liabilities. There's some limitations there, too. Um, so people, for instance, you know, you could put in a negative balance somewhere in the tree and sort of offset something to hide losses. You know, you might need to have a third party come and audit this, which again, puts the trust back into a third party instead of on chain. Um, so that's a limitation currently today. There's also, depending how people's cold storage is architected, it can be, you know, unsafe or challenging to sort of, you know, to sign a message for every single address in cold storage. You know, for instance, um, Coinbase uses a cold storage architecture that breaks up keys and stores them in different geographies with different sets of, um, you know, uh, basically uh, consensus mechanisms around who can improve and restore those funds online. And, and so by bringing the different pieces together to sign a message, it fundamentally reduces the security of that. And you basically have to, you get to a place where you'd have to kind of rotate every single key in cold storage to effectively go and do this. Not every firm out there has stuff built in quite that way. And, and it actually makes me a little nervous sometimes when I see how easy it is for them to go sign a message with every single address in cold storage in a relatively short period of time. It makes me wonder about what the architecture of that is underneath. But some of this stuff will get better with multi-party computation. I think that that provides a piece of the puzzle. Um, and just generally, as we develop better on-chain accounting standards, I think eventually you'll be able to um, you know, hit a button and basically get, you know, <laughs> proof uh, financial statements generated off of um, a business that's being run entirely on chain. But this is going to take a little bit of time. We saw a really cool blog post from Vitalik uh, working with Bology and some folks at Coinbase and others. So I think we're moving in this direction. Um, but for now, you know, audited public financial statements uh, for Coinbase are also a really good option that should give people hopefully some comfort. Maybe to end on a fun one, we're, we're celebrating the Thanksgiving holiday this week in the U.S., um, which is, I know, fun for everybody in crypto to go get asked questions by their friends and family. Uh, what's the one message that you would deliver to all the, the crypto skeptics that we're all going to be um, spending time with over the holidays? Yeah, well, it's definitely um, tough, you know, to go home and have your friends and family all asking questions if they're not actually in the industry. Um, I think it's important, you know, basically to make up our own minds about what we think is going to work in the world, what's not. And then, you know, you can try to convince people who are on the borderline, but I generally don't try to convince people who aren't really open to it. 
Um, this has been true, by the way, for the last 10 years. I like talking to people who have good points of view so I see what I can learn one way or the other. But if someone's really not into it, I don't try to convince them generally. I think the only thing that will convince people like that is just increasing the use cases for crypto. And so it's basically more effective, in my view, to go use our energy to go build interesting things in crypto than it is to try to convince people who are skeptical. So that's my two cents on that. And, you know, just try to have fun over the holidays. With everything going on in crypto, it can be easy to forget that we just had a midterm election here in the United States. So today we're gonna to chat about the election results and what that could mean for crypto. Joining me for the discussion is our very own head of US policy, Kara Calvert, welcome. We also have Marta Belcher, president of the Filecoin Foundation, and Chris Lahane, the chief strategy officer for Han Ventures. Thank you all for joining me, I appreciate you being here. And to kick this off, I thought it might be fun to go around to each of you and just give us a couple minute overview from your point of view. What are the most important issues we should be thinking about right now in the wake of the FTX collapse, the midterm elections, in the policy space for crypto generally? What races are you tracking? What outcomes do you think we need right now? And give, give us your, your high level overview. So Kara, you wanna kick it off? Yeah, thank you. So I really think what we've seen over the course of the last year is a, a truly um, arriving of crypto on the policy scene. And we've seen it at the state level, at the local level, and certainly here at the federal level. And I think what we'll see in the, in the following year is a building on that foundation. So whether it's in, I think for some of the races that I've been really closely watching, I think the the governor's race in New York is a great, is a great, um, temperature check here and trying to understand where crypto is headed in New York. It's our primary regulator with the New York DFS. So we were closely watching to see what is happening in the states. We've also seen it across the House and the Senate here in Congress and helping to determine what's, what's the trajectory next year of regulatory bills. And really what we're fighting for is to try to get more, uh, a, a clearer federal regulatory path while at the same time ensuring that the states can continue to operate and be innovative. And I think we've seen an election happen this year that is really gonna set the foundation for next year. Great, Marta, what are your thoughts? Well, I completely agree with everything that Kara has just said. Um, and I would add, I think this is a particularly important moment for cryptocurrency in Washington uh, with the fallout from FTX. Um, I think at this moment, um, any regulations that we see come through uh, are likely to not be great for innovation uh, in crypto. Um, and so for me, I think this is a moment when it's really important to remind lawmakers, first of all, that Cryptocurrency has use cases that go far beyond uh, finance and, and far beyond speculation and certainly far beyond with what we've seen with FTX. So I think it's a really important moment to talk about why crypto is so important for the future of the internet. Um, second, I think it's a really important moment to, to explain to regulators and lawmakers um, that what we saw with FTX was really a failure of centralized technologies, not a failure of decentralized technologies. Uh, and I think that uh, at this moment in time, uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, to make sure that what's happened with FTX does not um, cast a shadow over the rest of cryptocurrency in Washington. Washington. So I'm hoping that we can really get in there and do that education, um, particularly with this new group of lawmakers that are coming in. Brian, thanks for having me. Kara, Marta, it's always great to be uh, on a podcast with both of you. Uh, it's always tough to go after you guys have gone because you always say really smart things. Um, but I have three, three takes and they sort of interrelate uh, to one another. Uh, the first is just seeing the impact uh, of the youth vote. Uh, in this, in the midterms, um, you know, second highest in 30 years um, for voters, you know, 30 and under. Uh, and I'm saying this obviously as someone who's well, not obvious, but I'm a Democrat. I come out of Democratic circles, um, and the Democratic margin in this race uh, was in no small part due to how those young folks uh, voted. Uh, those same folks, if you sort of do the Venn diagram, overlaps an awful lot with my second point, which is the emergence, recognition, consciousness by elected officials of the crypto voter, the Web3 voter. Uh, a number of entities, including over at Han, had done polling over the course of the fall and identified that you know, nearly 20% of likely voters held a digital asset. And just to put that in a little bit of context, you know, that's basically twice as many people holding digital assets who are voting in this election as hold a union card. 
If you think that Twitter is somewhere around 23% of adults, at least it was prior to the last couple of weeks, you know, crypto is starting to get to those levels uh, in terms of just the number of people. You know, Brian, Coinbase, I think you guys have something like 60 million US adults on Coinbase. I could have that a little bit off. But you know, think of the presidential election voter universe of 200, uh, two, you know, 200 million people. Like you guys represent a really big chunk of those voters, um, and those voters really are these Web three voters. I do think elected officials are becoming much more conscious of them, and they do tend to tra track younger. They do tend to track uh, uh, much more diverse, um, and they're motivated by values. And that was a really interesting thing that we saw with the polling. Uh, these are folks who don't believe the current economic system is working really well for them. Uh, they don't like the power of big tech. They don't like the power of big financial institutions. And they look to digital assets for a, a more open, more accessible economic system. So takeaway number two, the emergence of that voter. And then I think takeaway number three, and this certainly relates to the debacle of, of FTX. Uh, I think this is happening at a moment when there's a lot more eyeballs on the Web3 space than may have happened when there were other controversies in the past. So I do think there's gonna be a longer tail and a bigger hangover uh, to this. And I think that really um, reinforces the point, Marta, I think both you and, and Kara were, were making in different ways, but how important it is for us collectively to be talking about the social value proposition uh, of, of Web3. And, and in particular, and Brian, I think you've been great out there. You've been talking a lot about this the last week or so. You know, this idea that there's really sort of two paths like we can continue on the path that U.S. regulators have taken, or we can think about actually putting in place a framework here that allows these businesses to grow here, work under the rule of law, be responsible. Obviously, Coinbase validation, I think, of, of the approach Coinbase has taken. I'm not just saying this because I'm on your podcast. I've said this already <laughs> at other venues. Uh, but I think for the space, they really need to be making making that point and, and making that argument uh, because I think these issues are going to be teed up for that conversation. Final, final, final. I said three points. Last one. If you actually look at some of these races, the John Fetterman race, some of the other races, economic nationalism was a big issue in those states. Uh, and it's going to continue to be. And this is sort of where it really overlaps with some of these issues. So um, I think a lot of really interesting things come out of this election. We have our work cut out for us, but some real positive levers that we can pull. Well, Marta, this next question is for you, but you know, Chris and Kara, feel free to jump in. I, I'll offer you jump in on any of these if you have something you want to specifically add. But Marty, it looks like you know there's at least 20 new members in the House and the Senate who are pro crypto. Um, how do you think this is going to play out? What does this mean for crypto legislation? How might something get passed in 2023? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so you know I think that uh, it's fantastic to see so many new members of Congress who uh, have an interest in crypto, um, and there's been a lot of uh, amazing work uh, to make that happen. Uh, and you know I think really what we're seeing here that is the most impactful um, is that we've seen first of all a change of control of the House from from Democrats to Republicans, um, and so I think that's going to have a bearing on really what can get done. Um, uh, in this next Congress. Um, but I think importantly, another thing that we're seeing is not just having new members of Congress who are interested in crypto come in, but crypto advocates in Congress actually taking leadership positions. Um, so one example is uh, Congressman Emmer being elected the House Majority Whip. Um, he's been an uh, avid champion for crypto for, for years. Um, and I think it's very likely um, that we'll also see uh, Congressman McHenry uh, become the chair of the House Financial Services Committee, um, which could also be very big for crypto. Um, I think he's someone who also has been a uh, really strong advocate for the space. Um, so I think those two things could really uh, help. Uh, I think one sort of big picture zoom out um, is that I think in, from my view, in recent years, we've really seen crypto uh, become uh, First, at first, it became, I think, uh, actually quite partisan, unfortunately. And I think we've been seeing that transition to being much less partisan. So you've been seeing a lot more Democrats who are starting to really get crypto. Uh, Senator Booker is one fantastic example of someone who really understands the value of crypto for progressive causes. Um, so I think over time, we've definitely seen cryptocurrency in really very recently just start to become much more bipartisan. Um, and I'm hoping that that's what we'll see um, in this upcoming uh, Congress as well.
I think the, the new members that you're seeing, it also represents a diverse set of interests, a diverse set of uh, different geographic locations, a diverse set of constituents. And so it's really bringing, to your point about bipartisanship, it's really bringing uh, different people together for very different reasons. And it's unifying how they're thinking about crypto as one unifying uh, issue here now in DC. And that's so rare. And we're seeing it again from far right to far left and everybody in between who may come to the table for different reasons, but they're at the same table. Yeah. So Chris, I mean, you worked in the Clinton White House and um, by the way, there's a great documentary that I love called The War Room and uh, talks about some of the comms efforts that go on in the background. I think maybe, Chris, you may want to tell a little bit of your story just about how your career started. But you know, my understanding is that um, in that Clinton White House where you were working, they, the, at that time, the Senate and the House were, were Republican in 1994. So um, we just learned that the GOP won the House um, in this midterm. And given that crypto is a bipartisan issue, but we have a divided government here, you know, how do you think this is going to work out with crypto policy efforts, um, especially in the wake of DCCPA uh, running into some trouble? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, you know, and just to the beginning of your, of your question, yeah, I served in the Clinton White House and the Clinton campaign in 92 and, and then over the two terms at, at the White House. And um, uh, amongst my responsibilities, uh, particularly in the White House, was helping to oversee the version of the war room that was sort of put together uh, in, in the White House. I had a lot more hair then. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that, that, that certainly had an impact on, on, my, uh, on, my, on my hair. But, um, uh, I, you know, this time period really reminds me an awful lot of 1996. And in 1996, you had obviously a Democratic Clinton White House and the Republican Congress. But 1996 was also when the Telco Act was passed. Um, and it was a bipartisan piece of legislation uh, in a time period, at least by that historical reference point where things were really polarized. And the reason these and ours, Democrats and Republicans came together on the 96 Telco Act was a, a general understanding that the US had an opportunity to make a policy decision to make sure that the internet was gonna be based and located uh, in the US. I think some of those same dynamics exist today in terms of the lessons learned or lessons extrapolated. Um, I think in some ways we're even more polarized than we were back then. Um, I also think given how close some of the numbers are in the Senate and the House, um, it may be even harder to try to thread that needle. That said, I do think one of the few areas where you have seen bipartisan agreement uh, over the last several years has been around issues of US taking positions vis-a-vis uh, -vis China um, and national security and economic competitiveness. And you know, you just look at the bipartisan support to make sure that the chips are going to be built here in the US. There's a pretty compelling argument that if we're going to be doing all of this from a Democrat and Republican perspective to make sure microchips are built here in the US, we should also make sure, damn sure, that we're building the blockchain here in the US as opposed to sending the blockchain offshore. Uh, and so I do think, and we talked about this in the earlier question, you know, that the, the more we can talk about uh, about this from a, a national security and economic competitiveness perspective, it actually helps thread that needle between the Democrats and the Republicans, because it is amongst one of the few issues that they'll all agree, agree upon. And I think Marta said it really well, and Kara has been a big, big, big contributor to this in terms of her work. This is now a bipartisan issue. Uh, and that's that's a pretty significant achievement. If you had asked me at the beginning of this year, you know, where crypto and Web3 would be from a Democrat Republican perspective, and you had told me we would end up, this would end up being bipartisan. Um, despite everything that's happened, that is a pretty significant achievement. And now I think it's really critical to build off of that. Yeah, it's been great to see that both sides of the aisle are kind of willing to work together on crypto issues. And um, it gives me more confidence that we'll see some regulatory clarity here in the U.S. hopefully in the next year or so. Kara, we've talked about the elections at the federal level that happened, but there's also in 6,200 state legislators that were elected as part of the, the midterms. And I'm curious, what's your take on how crypto policy will evolve at the state level in 2023? Yeah, 6,200 uh, elections on Tuesday and a lot of new members and all those new faces. Again, it's a diverse set, right? And with a lot of different interests. And I think we'll absolutely see an uptick this year in state bills. We saw last year hundreds, to be honest. There were across the different legislatures, 
everything from wanting to collect tax payment in crypto, wanting to be able to invest crypto in different ways, um, wanting to make sure that it was you know, environmentally sound. There are a lot of different bills out there. And I think what we'll see coming up next year is a lot of the same where you see states actually starting to compete for innovation. And they start to think about how do we ensure, how do we create a state regulatory regime? Because again, you know, Coinbase is, as, as you well know, you set up the company this way where, you know, we have 45 money transmission licenses. We have licenses in every locality that we need to operate. We have a bit license. We have a New York trust charter. And so we really have to be um, thoughtful about how we work in the states because that's the regulatory regime we work under now. And so we'll be working with all these state legislators as they come in. Certainly, we are at the same time going to keep pushing for federal regulation. That's, we think at the end of the day, this is a, you know, not only is it global and, and cross border, but here in the US, it really makes a lot of sense to have a federal framework. So everybody is on the same playing field, everybody is responding to the same rules. So we think that there will have to be federal legislation next year. And we have a really good you know, ground game for that. Again, I think that these are going to have to work together at the state and federal level. Well, Marta, let me come back to you. So I think there's agreement that the current regulatory framework for crypto doesn't work, especially here in the US. Um, so how does an organization like Filecoin Foundation think about how to improve that situation and create workable rules for crypto right here in the U.S.? Well, I think the first most important thing to say uh, is that it is a myth that cryptocurrencies are unregulated. Um, and whenever you hear people talking about regulating cryptocurrency, um, I think it's really important to make it clear um, that actually the on-ramps and off-ramps where people are buying and selling and custing cryptocurrency, I mean, I don't have to tell you this, Brian, um, are heavily regulated, right? Um, they're chartered banks or trust companies or state licensed money trans transmitters, and um, they have minimum capital requirements and they're posting bonds and opening their doors to yearly examinations um, and they're cooperating with law enforcement. Um, and so um, I really think that it's um, a, a, a myth um, that we really, I think, as an industry should be making very clear to people is actually this space is, is heavily regulated. Um, I also really object to the framing in general of the idea of regulating a technology. Um, I don't think we should think about it as regulating a technology. I think we should think about it as regulating activities um, related to that technology. Um, so just to give you an example, uh, if someone is committing fraud, um, it doesn't matter whether they're committing fraud using cryptocurrency or the phone or email or a pen and paper, right? So that technology really um, doesn't matter. And there are all sorts of actions, obviously, that can be taken because fraud is, is already illegal. So basically, zooming out big picture, um, basically, we already do uh, sensibly apply existing laws and regulations to the cryptocurrency space. And I think we need to make that really clear. So there isn't this sense uh, among regulators and among um, among policymakers in Washington that this space is just the Wild West. Um, so how could regulators actually help to bring clarity, uh, further clarity to the space, this, the, the type of clarity that we really need? Um, so, you know, while I do think for the most part, existing laws and regulations are being sensibly applied to cryptocurrency. Um, one area where we could really desperately use some clarity from Congress is to define the circumstances under which a digital asset is or is not a security. Um, and there have been bipartisan proposals to, to address that issue in the past. Um, I think there are also some um, really fantastic examples we've seen uh, of, of regulate, uh, you know, potential regulations, including um, SEC Commissioner Purse's proposed uh, safe harbor to give cryptocurrency projects a number of years uh, to launch a product uh, to ensure it's decentralized. Um, so those types of things, I think, could bring a lot of clarity in addition to the rules and law that are already applied to cryptocurrency every day. Coinbase is already regulated today, like you said, like other crypto companies in the US, uh, but we're regulated under traditional financial services regulation. And so the part where we still don't really have clarity as an industry is around the crypto specific pieces, like what is a commodity, what's a security, uh, what's a stable coin, what's artwork, and what are the requirements there? And I think the chilling effect uh, that we've seen in the US due to the, the lack of clarity there, some of the negative rhetoric that, that has unfortunately pushed a lot of this industry offshore, which is something that doesn't really, it, you know, arguably it harms American investors, it harms American businesses. Um, it's not really good for anybody here. And so we haven't seen that level playing field enforced. Um, Chris, let me turn it over to you. I mean, looking into your crystal ball here for 2023, what do you think we need to do as an industry to get this regulatory clarity? And 
yeah, what do you think is going to happen? What, 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 would, what would regulatory clarity actually look like if you had a specific uh, answer or proposal here? Yeah, well, a couple of things. I, I think, you know, I think you're likely to see some action around stable coins. We talked about Congressman McHenry being in charge of the House Financial Services Committee. He's been working on this for a while. Um, and I think actually working with Democrats on this. Um, I think as I think Kara was touching on earlier, you're going to see states start to take a more aggressive step. And I think uh, we're seeing, I'm sitting here in California, and I think this is a state where you have a governor and an executive branch that's really eager for California to, to continue to be the home of the internet and is um, you know, wants to approach this, what I would say, in an offensive way. Like they actually want to uh, embrace the innovation and use this in a really positive way. Um, I you know am concerned that given that the House is under Republican control, Senate's under Democratic control, uh, that some of the larger frameworks that we're really looking for could get delayed a bit. Well, I don't think it's in our national security interest. I don't think it's in our economic competitiveness interest. I don't think it's in our consumer's interest for all the issues, reasons we've talked about here. And that takes me to my final point, Brian, which is you know, we do have this incredible superpower, which are the folks who hold the digital assets out there. Um, I mean, to have almost 20% of the voters uh, be folks who hold digital assets is just a huge community out there. And I think the more we can engage and involve them in our advocacy efforts, the, the stronger that, that we will be. Uh, you know, it's really simple. Elected officials want to know what gets them to 50 plus 1% of the vote. Like, do they win or lose elections? You know, and as they begin to understand the position they take on crypto and Web3 potentially impacts a huge chunk of that electorate, um, you know, their hearts will follow and their minds will follow pretty quickly. Uh, and so I think, you know, us being able, us collectively, uh, you know, being able to, to work with our community, which, you know, is incredible and passionate about these issues so that their voice is actually heard with these officials, I think is the single biggest, most important thing we can do to get the progress that the space needs. I like that a lot. And I mean, in a democracy, the government works for us, the people, yes. right? And so if the people want crypto, um, we're going to elect leaders that are, that are, helping shape that in a positive way. And they're going to appoint regulators who are doing that in a thoughtful way. So um, I think as we grow the crypto community, there's a grassroots movement there that really is going to have many downstream effects. And we've tried to build a bit of this into the Coinbase app, by the way, too. People, you know, if you have the Coinbase app, you can kind of go into the that hamburger menu in the top left and check out the crypto advocacy link there. But we're trying to make it easier and easier for the, this growing crypto community, like Chris talked about, to go find information about elected officials, the races coming up in their jurisdictions. And, you know, you can see information from um, our third, a third party that we added there about who has a grade on crypto. You know, are these candidates understanding crypto and the innovation potential or are they anti-crypto for, for, you know, whatever reason? So anyway, Kara, let me turn it over to you. What do you think is going to happen in 2023 with these various bills going through Congress, the pieces of it, will they come back in a different format? And and what, again, what is that same question I asked Chris, what does that clarity look like uh, if you could wave your magic wand and suddenly have crypto clarity of regulation in the US? Yeah, so I think that there are three buckets that I, the way I've been thinking about legislation right now in Congress is you have a comprehensive approach and then you have something that is more targeted potentially with CFTC spot authority. And then you have stablecoin legislation. And Chris mentioned that stablecoin legislation, it seems like um, because it's easier and it's more parallel to what financial and financial uh, finance traditional finance looks like with a dollar right people kind of understand that it's one to one backed it moves kind of like a dollar it feels like a dollar we can probably regulate it kind of like currency so that seems like something that they could get across the finish line but it's proved really hard because when you think about a framework for stable coins how does that impact to your point earlier about what is a commodity what is a security what is a stable coin so all of these things are kind of intertwined and so that's why um, i think we've seen bills like the lumbus Gillibrand bill, which everybody I think would widely agree that it's the most comprehensive legislation that's been introduced. It has a CFTC component, an SEC component. And um, to Chris's point, I think is really, really critical is this idea that we've got to define how we think about the SEC jurisdiction here. And right now with, with no clarity, which makes it really difficult. Uh, as you know, we don't list securities on the Coinbase platform. So that doesn't make sense for us, but there's a whole market that needs to be unlocked, a whole digital asset securities market that I think if we had a framework there, we could actually really allow consumers, as you just said, consumers want it. And if consumers want it, we need to build it in a safe and reliable way. And so I think then the, the other approach with the DCCPA the premise is right there. While you know there's certainly 
um, there, there may be some flaws and we have to deal with DeFi. We have to make sure DeFi is protected in Amarda's earlier approach in, in terms of the protocols and the technology. We absolutely have to clear the way for innovation and make sure that we're not locking that down. But we need to make sure that it's safe and it's reliable and it's trusted. And the way we do that is we look at the activities and the intermediaries. So I think the DCCPA creates a really good foundation for next year. You have the thompson Connor bill. So you have stop, stab it out Bozeman, which is the DCCPA. You have the, it's a, a comparable bill in the house with the thompson Kana bill, also going through the ag committees and thinking about how can you give the CFTC spot authority. I hope, and I, I think that we will see next year, uh, these bills move forward in a way that makes a lot of sense for CFTC authority. I also think that we'll see something on the SEC. I think what we, this has proven is we really have to have something that goes hand in hand. The CFTC and the SEC don't exist in a vacuum. So we have to find a way forward on that. And then I think of course, stable coins will be a part of that. So I'm really actually, I think what we've often seen in terms of a split Congress is you generally end up with better legislation. It may not be easier. It's certainly harder when you have to bring two parties together to actually get legislation across the floor. But at the end of the day, you tend to end up with better legislation, more well vetted, more thoughtful. And I think that that's what we're going to get out of this process, because a lot of groundwork has been laid. There are a lot of people who are engaged in Washington. There are a lot of people from the crypto community. I have never th seen anything like crypto Twitter and the way that it has been great engaged in the policy making process. It has been absolutely awesome. And to your point earlier about how we're going to help um, harness their their collective power, I think it's going to be really, really important next year. So, Kara, in the wake of FTX's collapse, uh, how are people in D.C. feeling? You know, I we've been tracking a lot of this on Twitter and there's all kinds of memes and blockchain analytics stories being broken. What's going on in D.C.? How do people feel in the wake of this FTX collapse? Is this going to harm our chances for bipartisan legislation? I think what it's going to do is focus people. So there were a lot of questions about what was the role of, of Sam and FTX in the process here. And, you know, I, I, I think it's really important to, to mention that there were there are a lot of amazing staff, really smart staff who are doing really hard work in terms of writing this legislation and trying to trying to move it forward. And so I think um, to characterize in any sense that it's entirely a bill written by industry, I just think is false. And we have to make sure that, that the legislators move forward and they they're working really hard to find a solution. We have a lot of crypto forward people or, or at least people who understand that it's not going away and we need to address it. And so I think that that's where they're coming from now is that it, while Sam was very prominent in DC and I think a lot of people do feel duped, I think that they feel like they engaged in a relationship and that it wasn't, um, that it, that it wasn't real. And so I think that's incumbent on the rest of the, the crypto industry, but people who are both in DC to engage and continue to educate. Marty, you mentioned that earlier, is to continue to talk about the use cases, to continue to talk about why this is good, but also do it back home, right? So for all of the people who may engage with policymakers, go to town halls, email, send in letters, that I think that that's really important. And that's the way we're gonna come out of this, is that broadening the base, that it's not all about FTX. I do think that there will be legislation next year. I do think that they will try to be smart about it. I think that at the end of the day, I don't know if we'll, we'll see him alter his approach, but I think Congress will take a much more clear view on this. They will have much more oversight of it. And I think that we'll, we'll see action next year. There's this also this perception, and I think Marta, you nailed it when you said that there's this myth that we're unregulated. But I also think that there's also a myth that we want lighter regulations or that we, um, that we want different sure. rules at the SEC that are less protected, they, they, they create less protection for investors or for customers. And I think that that's just false because the rules, if you just apply the existing rules to crypto, it doesn't work. It actually does not provide the consumer protections that they want it to because crypto is different. You don't have the same types of, you know, um, closed door rooms where decisions are being made by a room full of executives. You have an open blockchain, you have open source, you have white papers, you know what's happening. And so the same types of disclosures, the same types of rules simply don't apply. And so that's one of the reasons we, you know, we, su we submitted the petition to the SEC back in July, laying out 50 different questions for what they needed to answer to make the rules make sense. Not because we want less rules, or lighter rules, but because we want rules that actually protect investors and consumers. So I think that in terms of whether or not he likes us, you know, putting your head in the sand and hoping we go away is not the solution because obviously people want this. You know, we have all of these now customers um, across the globe, right, who want to engage. We're a US company, so we abide by US laws. 
but there are a lot of people who aren't in the US and a lot of companies who aren't in the US and are not following the same rules. So people will go to those if they want different products. And that's really unfortunate. Yeah, Kara, you make such an important point here. You know, the industry, Coinbase, the front of the line, have just been asking for, 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 for the clarity and the rules, like new rules for a new thing to allow for responsible innovation. Like you're not asking for something, you know, that would be, you're, you're actually asking for the stuff to help protect the consumers out there. And, you know, all of this reminds me of, I'll tell a very, very quick story if I could, Brian, but at 1850s, 1860s, the UK, then England, you know, is really the first country to build and develop early versions of what became the car. Shortly after they did that, they passed something called the red flag law. And the red flag law required that there be a, with that car, that there be a driver, a passenger, and someone walking in the front with a red flag to pull the car over if it actually came up to a horse. It was prohibited from going faster than the horse. It basically effectively killed the auto industry in England. You flash forward 45, 50 years, Henry Ford, other innovators in the US start to build out the car. What does the US government do? The US government works in partnership, passes laws to actually build roads to help scale the industry. And there's a pretty thorough through line from that to the you know, US becoming the arsenal of democracy in the Second World War to the US, you know, the 20th century becoming the US century. And you know, I do think as we go from you know, what was an industrial revolution, we're now going into the digital revolution. You know, to me, there is a real analog to all of this, is effectively a version of that red flag law to the detriment you know, of long-term US interests. Yeah, well, crypto has definitely been spooking some horses, and I, I, I'll leave it up to the listener to decide <laughs> who's the horse in this analogy. But um, Marta, let me turn it back to you. So um, let's talk about DeFi a bit. I mean, this was a hot button issue in the DCCPA bill. It's kind of a difficult concept for many people to wrap their heads around, um, including f folks in Congress. And so, but it has a lot of innovation potential. It's still early days. So how do you think we create clarity and regulation about DeFi or should we just kind of punt on that for now and just get the easier stuff figured out around centralized custodians, exchanges and stablecoins? Yeah, so um, to your second question, I think we absolutely are not in a position right now um, where we're going to get uh, the clarity uh, and types of rules and regulations we need around DeFi um, if we are to move forward with uh, some sort of bill at this moment in time. Um, so I think it's very important that uh, this is not the moment that we are talking about writing the rules uh, for for regulating regulating DeFi. Um, so I think, um, you know, that's one of the reasons uh, it's, it, it's very important that the uh, we think very carefully about which bills are uh, advancing in the coming weeks and months, uh, which of course was the the whole topic of conversation between uh, SBF and uh, Eric Forhees before all of the rest of this went down. Um, second, I actually think that this is a really uh, interesting moment of opportunity for DeFi um, because what we saw with FTX um, was really a failure of centralized technologies, not decentralized technologies. Um, and I think we could actually message this appropriately as, um, you know, look at why it's so important to create technologies that enable public verifiability um, and enable transactions to happen peer-to-peer uh, -peer without an intermediary in between. Sorry, Brian. Um, you know, I think this is, um, this is actually a really great moment to message why technologies that don't require intermediaries um, are so important and how that uh, you know, how that has really, um, how that uh, could have created a different scenario um, than what we saw with FTX. Uh, so I think this is an interesting moment for that. And I, I hope that we'll see a lot of the messaging around that coming out of the industry in the coming months in Washington. Absolutely. And no need to apologize. You know, we're, we're big <laughs> fans of DeFi here at Coinbase. And, uh, you know, I, the way I think about it is some of our products are going to help people get fiat into crypto first step and a lot of those are more centralized but once people have crypto we want them to be able to participate in the more decentralized crypto economy with our other products coinbase wallet etc self-custodial wallets are great you know web3 is great DeFi is great we're, we've even started building some uh DeFi apps ourselves so anyway we're we're hopefully gonna you know have both chapters and, and help that all come to fruition let me just ask you you know 
put it again, look into your crystal ball here and like by this time next year, where do you hope we are going to be as an, in, as an industry? Um, where do you expect we'll be in terms of regulation and legislation? So I hope in a year, I really do think that we will, um, what my hope is, is that we will have bipartisanship and we will have members of the house, the Senate and, and all the state houses and the governors that are working together to get smart crypto regulation. Where I think we will go is actually, I think we will have legislation next year in Congress. I think that we will have a bipartisan bill. I think it will be very hard to get across the finish line by the end of the year, but I think it's doable if there's a committed group of people to do a coalition of the willing, uh, if you will. And so I think that we will, in one year from now, I do think we'll have a, a little bit better track on where we're gonna be headed on these issues. I think for um, for DeFi, we have a lot of work to do because there's a lot of education that needs to happen. And it's really hard to explain um, to both regulators and to members of Congress what it is, unless they touch it, feel it, understand it. It's one of the reasons why, um, Brian, you mentioned earlier that we are building tools and trying to enable uh, not only the crypto community to come talk to Washington, but actually enable them to contact their members and to think about like how they could actually engage. And so we're trying to figure out ways to amplify their voice and provide tools for them to do that. And I think that that's what's gonna help get the message across and bring people to the table. I think it's also really important for regulators to be able to touch and feel this stuff. And right now they are not allowed to touch and feel crypto. And that's a real problem when your regulators can't own and deal with crypto and they can't get on, they can't use wallets and they can't use DeFi. How on earth are they supposed to regulate it if they can't explore it and understand what it is? And so I think that those are some of the things that we're really going to have to work on over the year. Chris, thoughts? Yeah, I have two uh, two thoughts, I guess. Um, well, first of all, I will just uh, emphasize how awesome it has been to be on this. Uh, you know, Marta and I have done a series of meetings together and I always called her the, the secret weapon in these meetings. And I mean that only in the most positive way uh, because she's so compelling. And you know the work that Kara has done on behalf of both Coinbase, but really the entire community uh, and helping uh, where we are in DC is, has been amazing to watch. Um, the two, my two big takeaways is um, message and voters. Uh, I hope that you know a year from now, that when people think about, particularly policymakers, elected officials, opinion elites, think of crypto and Web3, they're not just thinking about it as you know a financial speculative tool or class. They're actually thinking about this as um, as our from a national and economic security perspective and understanding, or at least beginning to understand that you know there is going to be a battle for what the pipes of the internet look like going forward. And for the U.S. to win on that prevail, and 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 small d democratic values to prevail on that, it's incredibly important that the U.S. is leading with this next generation of the internet. Um, that's pretty ambitious, but I do think um, I do think that is doable because it's such a compelling case. And I think the second is, and this has been a repeated theme, but but the the manifestation of those Web three, those crypto voters, you know, the presidential process has already kicked itself off. I think New Hampshire and Nevada, which is two of the earliest uh, voting states, uh, also are states that have some of the highest per capita percentages of, of owners of digital assets. I, I think it'll be great as uh, candidates begin to campaign in those states that they begin to realize that 20% you know, of the vote in New Hampshire is a really, really, really big chunk of that vote um, and that you're going to need to speak to those voters. So um, those would be my two goals, ambitions, aspirations. Yeah. Marta, the final word to you. Well, thank you for giving me the final word here. Um, Chris has been just absolutely phenomenal in hosting these this series uh, with policymakers um, and really getting people together to explain um, the fantastic use cases beyond finance uh, to uh, policymakers. And I think it's really been fantastic to educate people directly. So thank you for hosting those, Chris, and for all your other incredible work, uh, Chris and Kara. Um, I'm sorry to be a downer, um, but, but um, you know, we haven't talked about this a lot on uh, this episode of the podcast, um, but I actually think where a lot of the action is going to be this coming year um, is really going to be in privacy. 
Um, so what we've seen from a regulatory perspective recently um, is regulators increasingly uh, taking the uh, intense financial surveillance of the traditional banking system and applying it to crypto and in fact applying it in a way um, that is really problematic. So for example, um, with Tornado Cash, putting an entire protocol on the sanctions list um, and taking positions about privacy coins and technologies that enhance the ability to make transactions privately and anonymously, um, that those types of technologies are bad or straight up illegal, um, which to me is, is both shocking um, and extremely problematic from a constitutional perspective. Um, and so I, I think this is really where a lot of what's happening in uh, crypto law is is heating up. And I think these are really important battles for us to take on both in the public sphere, uh, also in Congress uh, and in the courts uh, this coming year. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that. Um, I, I totally agree. I think privacy is very important in, in many regards, but especially with our financial data and the current system, which essentially, you know, deputizes financial institutions to sort of require them to spy on their customers on the government's behalf, even if we don't want to collect this data, you know, that, that's a very strange system. I never really agreed with it. And, um, you know, obviously we have to comply with all laws that are out there, but it doesn't mean there aren't opportunities to improve on that. So that's another great area to look at. And I, I hope that the U.S. government, the regulators, policymakers, and the crypto industry use this as a moment, this unfortunate moment with FTX and, and, and the midterms as a moment to sort of say, hey, this is our opportunity to finally go get that that regulatory clarity that we need. Um, let's not do regulation for regulation's sake. Let's <laughs> try to do it in a thoughtful way that's actually going to preserve the innovation potential here. And with DeFi and self-custodial wallets, we can actually make a much better global financial system. So let's see if we can go do it. And we've got our work cut out for us. Thank you all for joining uh, the podcast, and we will talk to you soon. This has been the Around the Block podcast. We'll be back in two weeks. In the meantime, you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for joining. Today's conversation is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal or investment advice. Actual results may vary materially from any forward-looking statements made and are subject to risks and uncertainties. 